So if you turn to Galatians uh, chapter 5, as we continue our study in the book of Galatians, Galatians 5 verse 22, as we looking at real sanctification, and then we're going through the fruit of the Spirit, Verse 22, we read, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. You see, uh, the first triad that we've, we've been studying is uh, the, the one, uh, love, joy, and peace. Now, we, we speak of love for God, joy in God, and peace with God. And uh, we gave you a little formula that love plus joy equal peace. And remember, this first triad is it comes to us as we commune and fellowship with God, the Godhead. So that's why we believe the first triad is towards God. The second is more towards uh, gentleness, goodness, faith is towards others. And then meekness, temperance, um, faith, meekness, and temperance is more towards ourselves. There's three areas of peace, and we're on this section of peace. We talk about peace accomplished. Uh, what a glorious thought that is. Uh, the Lord Jesus had accomplished peace through the blood of his cross. But there has to be uh, peace experienced. And then uh, we, there has to be peace displayed. And uh, all those work together with, with this uh, one as we commune and fellowship with God. Now, we said uh, the the peace uh, uh, peace experience and peace displayed is all all uh, predicated or based upon peace accomplished. Now, yesterday on the streets, I was proclaiming uh, one of the tracks we have is is it says is the cross foolishness, and I was I was thinking of you know the the gospel uh, the cross is not a a, a a thing that you wear around your neck cross is not a piece of wood that you adore and adoration. No, uh, cross is, is, is in a sense a symbol of execution. It's, it's capital punishment where, where the Lord Jesus died in the place of, of sinners, our substitute. But you see, as I proclaimed um, peace accomplished, it seemed like no one really cared. No one was impressed. Peace with God. Think of that for a minute. Peace with God. Such a uh, historical, his, I mean, universal event that Christ would die on the cross and shed his precious blood. They walked by and they said, who needs that? Who needs peace with God? Such are experiencing, as we, we've said before, they're engulfed, they're, they're sheltered in this world's peace. This world's peace. Let me read to you the, uh, John 14, 27, as we mentioned, this is the peace that has been bequeathed to us. It's part of our inheritance. Uh, the last will and testament of the Lord Jesus. He says, Peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. No, no. Uh, see, there has to be uh, this world's peace represents the strongholds of Satan. This world's peace uh, speaks of a refuge of lies. Refuge of lies. That, that the sinner, uh, in a sense, uh, holds on to and fortifies themselves. The fortification of the carnal lost mind against the light, the truth of the Word of God. I said this morning, you know, uh, I believe in, in the doctrines of grace and God, Holy Spirit, will bless the Word of God. And, and but without the blessing uh, of God, not one proton of light, spiritual truth, can enter into the heart and mind of a lost sinner. I'm going to speak about uh, a little bit about the taking of man's soul. Well, what is that? Well, that's holy war from John Bunyan. It's an old test. Uh, it's an old uh, Puritan classic. If you've ever read it, it's, it's amazing. But the taking of man's soul. 
And you think of this, well, you know, their minds are fortified, their hearts are fortified, they're under satanic delusion, maybe they're trusting in their religion, and their, fortif their carnal lost mind, they're dead in trespasses and sins, and you're telling them about the peace accomplished, and they don't care at all. What is the sinner's hope? I mean, I, I couldn't have Arme I couldn't be an Armenian preacher. I'd be in despair. I would be in despair. But I'd, I'd have to change my message. I'd have to change my method. I'd have to do something to, some kind of gimmick that would work. To get them in. Get them down to the front. And that's what modern Christianity has turned out to be. A lot of it. What is the hope? Well, you know, you don't want to, well, you may say, well, I don't, uh, I don't like being called a Calvinist. I don't like the idea of self, uh, you know, doctrines of grace. But maybe this is our, our, our banner is salvation is of the Lord. I think we can go with that. Salvation is of the Lord from beginning to end. So the Lord says here, when he's dealing with the rich young ruler, he says, how hardly, he says, very listen to you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And then his disciples were amazed. It says, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. See, that's the hope we have this evening, brother, as we, yes, we see the world's peace, and it's like a, a force field <laughs> around the, the sinner, and, and it seems everything that you try uh, to penetrate that force field just bounces off. But God says, uh, the Word of God says, salvation is of the Lord. And we have hope uh, the impossible can be done. Let's, looking at, let's look at it, the taking of man's soul. You see, peace accomplished is so important, and we glory in that. But there, one, there was once upon a time that peace accomplished didn't really, you didn't really care for, or you didn't, it wasn't important at all. You see, you have to experience the peace of God. And that's what we're talking about, that next part. You see, once you experience the peace of God, then you can have peace displayed in your life as a Christian, and that's really, as, as we're in trials and temptations and persecutions, you know, and, and <coughs> uh, the love and the joy kicks in, and the peace comes like a river. Taking a man's soul. I was thinking of, uh, and again, if you've never read uh, Pilgrim's Progress or, or Holy War, uh, you're missing out on something, okay? It's, uh, but see, I was thinking about God's war chest. You see, the sinner is at war with God. Now we say tonight, well, God is not at war with the sinner, not with his elect, not in the sense we, we realize he's peace accomplished, he's been reconciled. Uh, but any sinner, lost sinner, tonight, here, listen, if you're outside of the, the, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, if you haven't trusted him by faith and repented of your sins, you're in danger. You're in danger. I can't, you see, I can't, uh, with all my pleading and, and weeping and crying and urging, you see, I can't open your eyes to, 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 to convey you that concern. I can't. I, I, you know, words can't, you know, you, you try to express it in words, we should, with arguments, with, with, with telling the truth and love, but you see, unless the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and, and He does that. Isn't that amazing? He does that. That's our hope. But in this war chest, I was thinking, uh, you know, of course, the, the, the general, I'm not trying to demote the Holy Spirit, but, you know, the, the, God, the Lord of the harvest, this morning we talked about that. He, he, he's the, you know, infinite five-star uh, general, you know. He's, he's, on the, he's on the battlefront. And uh, you have uh, conviction of sin. You have the word of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. And yes, Christians are, are to wield it and, and use this, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But we're looking at God's war chest and the taking of a man's soul. And, and the object of conviction of sin is to shatter. Isn't that, uh, 
You ever, you know, you know those uh, corral? I don't pick on corral, but you know, uh, corral, uh, they're really nice uh, dishes. Some of them are pretty expensive. But what happens when you drop them? I like the ones that, I don't like corral. I don't, not anymore. Uh, but they shatter into a, a million pieces, a thousand pieces. You know, what, uh, I like the ones that just clunk and break in two. Because <laughs> cleaning up all those little glass slivers, it can be pretty dangerous. And you're going to get every one of them. But think of it as, as, as a corral bowl falls to the ground and has to shatter. And so, out of God's war chest, the operative object of this battle is to shatter the world's peace that reigns in the sinner's heart. Listen, dear ones, that's an impossibility for us as, as we can't do that, but God can. But listen to me, it has to be done. It has to be done. See, the scriptures tell us that God, he says, I kill, now make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32, 39. You mean God kills? God kills? He kills the sinner? Yeah, in a way, that's, that's the whole thing. You see, uh, we have to realize the cross has to be applied to the sinner. To the elect sinner. And, and then uh, from death to life. Uh, resurrection life. The Holy Spirit does that marvelous work of regeneration. Let me read something that Spurgeon says <clears throat> in uh, Forgotten Spurgeon. He's talking about, um, he says, the, the emphasis is intended to be upon you. He's talking about modern uh, Armenianism, uh, the Baptist Union in his day, as the, the, the flood of Armenianism, modernism, things of that sort, was coming in. But especially, Mark, uh, he's, this, this section is uh, Armenianism against the Scripture. The emphasis is intended to be upon you. And the impression is unbordably given that it is only our faith which can save us. As though faith were the cause of salvation. This is the very reverse of Spurgeon's conception of the spirit of gospel preaching. Now this is Ian Murray writing this, okay. But he quotes Spurgeon. Spurgeon says, I could not preach like an Armenian, he says. And in the following passage, he tells us precisely why. What the Armenian wants to do is to arouse man's activity. What we want to do is to kill it at once and for all. To show him that he is lost and ruined, and that his activities are not now at all equal to the work of conversion, that he must look upward. They seek to make the man stand up. We seek to bring him down and make him feel that there he lies in the hand of God. And that his business is to submit himself to God and cry aloud, Lord, save or we perish. We hold that man is never so near grace as when he begins to feel he can do nothing at all. When he says, I can pray, I can believe, I can do this, I can do the other, marks of self-sufficiency and arrogance on his brow. Wow, it's virgin. Remember, that's the prince of preachers. Okay? Well, what did the scriptures tell us? It says, uh, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive. That's why the Lord says, I am the resurrection and the life. There has to be a uh, realization that death of the, the sinner is dead and trespasses and sins. And that's that part of that fortification. But this idea to kill the sinner, we're not talking about physically. We're talking about spiritually. We're talking about when we go to God's war chest and we pull out the sword of the Spirit. We believe that's what the Holy Spirit is going to use. And this idea to kill the sinner it means you have to be done with self. You have to put off from self. So Lord Jesus says, if any man follow me, what? Take up his cross and, and follow me and deny self. You see, we have to take sides against ourself. And that's the whole idea of crucifying self. 
I mean, it's not going to be, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, some meritorious act that we're doing. It's just that the sinner has to die, like Spurgeon said. Uh, Armenian uh, gospel, today's gospel, wants the sinner to do something. Spurgeon says, I want them to die. Until they die to self. That's that shattering of self. That's the shattering of that world's peace. When this uh, preaching of the law and uh, conviction of sin, really this is the, 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 uh, the, the found foundation of repentance. Repentance. Call to repentance. When we preach the law and we call sinners to repentance and we, we, we hold up a standard of new life in Christ, when this is all missing in our preaching and teaching, and you think about it, then the thorns and the briars and the stony heart and the sinner remains. There's just, uh, again, uh, you, you see, we think of the, 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 the briars have to be removed. Self-confidence has to be removed. Self-reliance has to be, you know, well, they say, well, you, know, you, you talk a lot about the things that a sinner has to experience. Well, no, no, it, it, very simply, uh, when God's in it, when there's real conviction of sin, you see, it's not, not try Jesus, or Jesus can make your life better. I mean, I wasn't preaching, Jesus can make your life better on the streets yesterday. I was preaching that we're rebels, we're traitors, anarchists, we're lawless. We've, we've, we have a sin debt so big, so enormous, it's, it's amazing that, that God allows us to breathe His air and we don't just fall right, sink down into hell. You say, well, you're, you're dramatic. No, that's really the case. That's what the Bible says. Our sins like weight weigh us down, take us to hell. But see, when uh, we bypass the war chest and God Holy Spirit's work in conviction and regeneration, and then uh, we leave out repentance, and we leave out requirements, or we lower the requirements of new life in Christ, so who of us here this, this evening would not want forgiveness of sins? Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, if I go to the streets, I could say, you know, free ticket to heaven. Forgiveness of sins. And they, they, they might ponder that because they, they realize they have sinned somewhat. But when, when you say, well, it also requires new life in Christ that you have to, you would want by the regenerating work of God to forsake your sins and turn from all your iniquity and, and and live a new life as, as evidence that you're really born again. Uh, I don't want new life in Christ. I'll take the free ticket, but I don't want new life in Christ. And if, and if we don't uh, specify these things in the preaching of the, of the gospel, you know, such remain unaware. They remain unconcerned. Maybe they're, they're awakened for a moment like the, the stony hearers. And the thorny hearers, maybe they're, they're awakened for a moment, and then what do they do? They fall fast asleep on their religious profession. Hey, I made a profession in Christ. I, I'm saved. They fall asleep upon their Christian profession, and they don't have to worry anymore. They're not concerned anymore. You say, once saved, always saved. Isn't that so? Once saved, always saved. They know that verse, or they know that theology. You see, more is needed. Well, we call it regeneration, imparting of new life. You see, we have to go back to the effectual call of God, first of all. It's God that calls sinners. And through the preaching of the gospel and that regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in the elect sinner's heart, and then we, we, we talk about conversion. They're two different things. What is the duty of the preacher? Well, I think what, what Matthew says in Matthew eleven twelve 12 says this. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Luke says you should com compel them to come in, press them to come in. You know, uh, take the kingdom of God by, don't, if, if, if you think it's just going to happen by, you know, osmosis, it's going to be, it's, a, it's an impossible thing. 
for the sinner to be saved. And first of all, the greatest thing, I think the hardest thing to, is for this worldly peace, this, blub, this bubble uh, force field of security, carnal, unawareness has to be shattered. And God, Holy Spirit, does that through conviction of sin. Let's look at some examples this evening about conviction of sin. You see, we, there, there's, a, we would, we, there's words that you've heard before, like, for example, legal and evangelical repentance. And sometimes it's a, it's a blur. And it says, what I mean, the transition from, you know, when does legal repentance become evangelical repentance? You see? When does, uh, you know, in the sense that uh, intellectual faith becomes saving faith? Historical faith become and, and that transition uh, is, is, is like different for every one of us. Really, it is. But see, you start at one point, you end up in the other point. But see, there are examples in the scriptures of what we would say legal repentance or a false confession. Look if you would to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6, verse 4 through 9. Now, we've studied this years ago when we went through the book of Hebrews, but I want you to see some things here. Notice what it says here. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Now this is, dear ones, this is not a, a believer falling away, losing their salvation. That's Arminianism. No, no. No. Look at verse 7 and 8. Remember I told you about, you see, if we don't uh, preach the law and preach the matter of uh, responsibility and evangelical holiness of God, the purity of God, man's responsibility to repent, uh, the standard, you know, if, if, if we don't bring sinners under conviction, and God will use the word of God for sure, and then the briars remain. Self-confidence, self-reliance, self-righteousness, okay? But notice in verse 7 and 8, for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Verse 7, I believe, speaks of those that are truly saved. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for for them, by whom it is dressed, receive its blessings. That, that's a saved person. What about verse 8? Well, that's the one who made a profession. That's the one that the Hebrew writer is, is speaking about, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. You know, see, um, the Puritans and, uh, were, were very uh, dogmatic in many ways. You know, so it's, so, it's so easy. It's, uh, in a sense, uh, how far... Uh, a religious person can go in their profession and still be lost. Because they never make their calling and election sure. See, the briars are never burned up. You see, the, the, they, they've made, remember I said, they make a profession and they fall back asleep on their uh, pillow of uh, Christian profession and they say, look, I, I made a decision for Christ. I did everything what the preacher wanted me to do. But you know what's the problem a lot of times? There's no peace. <laughs> a lot of activity. And so they say, there's something missing. So I'll make another decision. I'll come forward at another time. I'll come forward another time. I'll come, you know, I, I've read articles about young people coming forward, uh, doing everything the preacher said. Eight or nine times. And finally, they just give up. Satan has them now. Salvation ain't real. It ain't real. It never can be real. But you see, this uh, Hebrews chapter 6 is an example of what we say legal repentance. Repentance that's not saving. It's all over the world. 
How about Matthew 19? Remember the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler. Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. Verse 16 through 22. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which commandments? Which? Said, and Jesus said, Thou shalt uh, do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see, the Lord Jesus is not teaching work salvation. He's teaching what? This, the sinner's responsibility. Standard. He's bringing in the law. You see, the problem, uh, this young rich ruler says, what good thing can I do? You see, if he was really convinced by the law and sin and guilty, he would realize that he can do nothing good. Nothing. Good. Thought, word, or deed. But see, he's not convinced. And notice what he says there in verse 20. The young man said unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up. What lack did I yet? Wow. I always, I'm always amazed at verse 18. Uh, rich, which commandments? So I don't even know which ones. <laughs> A Jewish young man comes. Uh, which? Uh, you know, the, the rabbis, the traditions, the... Uh, do we take the liberals or the conservatives? I mean, you know, 660 some extra rule. Which? And Lord Jesus is so cool. I mean, he's just, let me just give you, go back to basis. Let's go to the Ten Commandments, the law. And then, uh, verse 20, I don't, I don't really believe that's an empty boast. When you think of Saul of Tarsus, right? Jesus said unto him, verse 21, if thou wilt be perfect. You know, yesterday I was, I was talking to people about being perfect. And I said, how good do you have to be? How many good things do you have to do? And I said, let me, let me tell you something. You have to be perfect. You have to be perfect as the Lord Jesus. And some of them looked at me like, and, and it, was, it was registering a little bit. Hey, perfect? You mean, I said, you have to be absolutely perfect. Perfect in thought, word, and deed, and you can never, ever sin, ever, ever, ever. That's what the Lord Jesus is saying. But notice he's, he's working on this rich young ruler to bring him to conviction. To, you see, he's shattering. <laughs> you see that? He's, he's ripping out the refuges of lies. He's, he's taking away the fortifications of the Lord Jesus, the, the best evangelist there is. If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard these things, he went away sorrowful. Second Timothy, second, uh, second Corinthians chapter 7, this is sorrow of the world. This is, the, this is the sorrow that, lead, that leads to despair. This is not the sorrow, uh, a godly sorrow, un, unto life. Okay? He went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. You see, he, we, we know the story, but uh, he was uh, unwilling to break away from his idols. His idols was his possessions, and we know the rest of the story. You see, both were awakened from the ease of the world's peace. We can go to Hebrews chapter 6, Matthew 19. Uh, we can think, again, we could add the stony ground hearers, the thorny ground hearers. I mean, they, they receive the word, they rejoice, and they, what, they go for a season, and uh, one, because they have no depth, no, the heart hasn't been opened up, they haven't seen the plague of their hearts. And then the, the thorny ground, well, the, the pleasures and the cares and the deceitfulness of riches enter in and choke the word where it becomes unfruitful. But see, the good ground, what happens? How did the good ground get good? Well, God made it good. Remember, that's the sinner's heart. 
God has to change the heart. That's regeneration. That's part of the new covenant. I will, I'll take away thy stony heart and I'll give you a heart of flesh. See, both of these examples fall short of saving regeneration. I mean, we could just stop for a moment and just think about Judas Iscariot. You know, he had a confident life. Confident life. When the disciples were all sitting around the Lord that last night, they all said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Meaning, the Lord says, someone here is going to betray me. You see, was there a little traitor sign on Judas's head? <laughs> no! You know, he, he was a treasure. He, had, he must have had some integrity. He was, he was pretty good. Deception, right? I believe there was, uh, you know, he had, uh, he did evangelism. Most likely, when he went out with the twelve, there was miracles and signs and wonders. He was one of them. Then, in the end, it was legal repentance. He didn't repent of his sins. He didn't trust Christ. He killed himself. Acts chapter 1 says he went to the place. He, he was the son of addition. The scriptures must be fulfilled. That's, that's amazing. That's by and by the bottom line. Let's go quickly as we think about this war chest, as we see you know, God bringing God, Holy Spirit, the, 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 the uh, infinite star general, you know, uh, he, he, he brings conviction of sin. Uh, he uses the law. He uses, uh, he opens up the heart, okay? Um, but we have to realize that there are those that fall short. But I want to give you some examples of, of evangelical conviction. Godly sorrow that needeth not to be repented of. Well, we read the prodigal son. Let's look at that for a minute. Luke 15, 17. And when he came to himself... Remember the day when you came to yourself? It was like a dream. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, you saw yourself in danger. You saw that you didn't measure up. Whatever the law, whatever the Holy Spirit used to convict you. You remember Saul of Tarsus, it was covetousness. I think the words of Stephen rung in his ears day and night, day and night. Day and night. He, he had no peace. He was like a madman. That's what happens when you're under conviction of sin and you have no place to run. And your peace of the world is being shattered. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy tired servants. And he arose. Dear ones, listen, there has to be confession of sin. There has to be the forsaking of sin. But dear ones, see, this is evangelical repentance. The elder son, later on in these verses, that's an example of legal repentance. I've done everything you wanted, I've, uh, you know, I've done everything the law wanted, and you never gave me a feast. That's legal. Works salvation. And so the prodigal son is a good example of conviction of sin, true repentance. It's evangelical. You see, it's, it's the Father. You see, his awareness is the Father. A lot of times in legal repentance is that, you know, it's God, and... Uh, I got caught, or, you know, I'm really weeping over the consequences over my sins. I, I want a better life. I want something better. You know, I'm, I'm tired of this misery. That's not really true repentance. It really isn't. I mean, the church says, try a little bit of Jesus. Jesus will make your life, you know, you know God has a wonderful plan for you. Does he? Not until you repent of your sins. And you trust Christ. But you see, the sinner can't do that. The sinner won't do that. God has to come in and break that, that worldly peace. And oftentimes, it's like the old Puritan says, you know, there's, there's, there's a, you know, 
children that's brought up in, in church. And it doesn't really take much conviction, right? It doesn't take much conviction, and they're in. But then one Puritan used to say, you see, when you come to a tree and there's this knotty hole there, and what do you have to do? You have to take the sledgehammer and you have to beat on it and beat on it and beat on it and beat on it. And that's, some of us had to be beat on pretty bad until we surrendered. But see, in that beating on, there, there's that, remember I said there's that transition from death to life. It doesn't become, you know, you know, God, uh, you know, I'm a thief, I got caught, I'm, I'm really sorry for the consequences of my sins, I, I'm tired of the misery, I want to be, you know, I, you see, when people, like one, one I, it's interesting, I have a, uh, I've collected a couple, couple books on revival, and they're, they're called revival manuals. It must be Charles Finney, no, <laughs> not Charles Finney. But these are, these are pastors. You see, in, uh, I think in homiletics, pastoring, in, in theology, they, all, you know, they used to have sections in these books about revival. And so there's one, uh, Humphreys, uh, uh, Revival sketchers, Sketches, and he goes through a bunch, and he's in the late, uh, eight, early 1800s, stuff like that. Um, some others, but see, they, they, they're, they're giving instruction to pastors how do you, you know, how do you deal with an awakened sinner in times of revival? Well, most of us wouldn't know what to do, wouldn't we? And so, but, but the, the thing is, you see, um, there's this, this, this passing from death to life. And so, as, as the sinner becomes uh, aware of their sins, and they, they were, they were uh, in a sense, they begin to press into the kingdom. They see themselves lost and undone. They flee to Christ. So the prodigal son is one. How about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus is another one. Uh, Zacchaeus, uh, in chapter 19, verse 7 and 9, is, is such a great example of repentance. Saving repentance. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. That's verse 7. Well, you know, Zacchaeus is in the tree. The Lord comes by, or he climbs into the sycamore tree, comes by, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. There's a sexual call. How does the Lord know his name? Well, this day, salvation has come to your house, Zacchaeus. And by the time he comes down from hit that tree, okay? You know, could you imagine what's going on in Zacchaeus' mind? Well, look, I always use these verses, you see, they were murmuring. That was the religious crowd, the Pharisees, others, that he was gone, the Lord Jesus. You see, um, in Zacchaeus, verse 8, as and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, and half my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. That's, that's the law. You see, that's true repentance. He's breaking off his sins with righteousness. But, but the thing is, I, I like these verses, and I like Zacchaeus this way, is because he's concerned with the Lord's reputation. You see, you call yourself a Christian... But you bring reproach, or you live in your sins, or you're a carnal Christian, or, you, you, know, you know, all these, no, no, Zacchaeus, no, he said, Lord, they're, they're murmuring against you. You see, Zacchaeus is saying, there's a real work in my heart. Let me show you. You see, he says, let me show you. He says, if I have, uh, behold, Lord, half my goods I give to the poor. Well, what about the rich young ruler? He wasn't willing to do that, was he? What was the difference? What was the difference? See, God shattered his worldly peace and brought conviction. We could go to the prodigal son, there's Zacchaeus, there's the publican. We mentioned that in 18, uh, Luke 18, 13, and we talked about the publican and the Pharisee. We've looked at Saul of Tarsus, Acts uh, 9 and Romans 7. We said that Paul is an example 
a pattern of how God saves sinners. And so there has to be this work of the law. There has to be conviction of sin. Why? Because God, Holy Spirit, is going to shatter. Now, dear ones, listen. It's so important that we don't apply the, the bomb of Gilead. Now, you know what a hyper-Calvinist thinks? This, this is uh, Dr. Silius. You say, you put a sinner on a rotisserie. That's conviction of sin. And you rotate them. And you keep poking them till they're done. So hyper-Calvinists, you see, the Armenian says, the sinner has all ability to come to Christ. The hyper-Calvinist says, you can't preach or witness to a sinner because they can't come. Because they're not one of God's elect. But until they are actually awakened, regenerated, once they are regenerated and awakened, then you can offer them the gospel. And so you rotate the sinner until they get done, and you say, yes, he's regenerated, he's, re he's, he's he repented enough, he's, remor he's done all these things, and once he gets done, then you can offer the gospel. That's a hyper-Calvinist. You see, we're not hyper-Calvinist. Praise the Lord. But we're not our meaning either. So Paul is an example. Let me give you a, a definition of saving and repentance. And then really this is, again, you say, well, you know, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, peace. You know, see, I, I would want all those people on the streets yesterday to experience the peace of God. I really would. I don't want one of them to go to hell. But I'm not God. But you see, proclaiming to them that peace has been accomplished just like water rolled off of a duck back, you know what I mean? Made no impression. And then even, you know, hoping that the terrors of the law and the judgment that come and righteousness like, like Felix and Festus, you know, they would tremble. That's what we need, brother. That's what we don't have in the preaching today. Preachers of the old times, they got up in the pulpit and they preached to sinners like Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. I mentioned him, Daniel Rowland, Hal Harris, others, Whitfield. See, the Spirit of God was moving and he was using his sword and the, and the treasure chest of, of war. He was, sinners were, you know, they were awakened. And when they were awakened, this, this worldly peace, this false confidence in self was shattered. They were being put to death in order to be, what? Resurrected with new life. So let me give you, a, uh, this is the definition of repentance, and I think this is really, you know, uh, a good definition. Louis Burkhoff, he's a, with the Lord, he's a Reformed Baptist kind of theologian. He's, he's good. He's a, he has some good stuff. Okay, he says the elements of repentance. Just like you, there are going to be elements of faith. You know, this whole idea of uh, lordship, salvation, and savior only salvation, all that controversy, and, and, and it's an interesting, you know, uh, John MacArthur, Dr. Lucilius, others, uh, in, in all their books, they're going to give you a definition of saving repentance. In all their books, they're going to give you a definition of saving faith. In all their books, they're going to give you a, a, a biblical uh, uh, setting forth of true conversion. Okay? But you see, uh, Savior only, most of them are Armenian. Free will gospel. Decisionism. Easy believism. Once saved, always saved. And, and most of the, the, the Lordship salvation uh, is, is not, they're not preaching another gospel, they're not adding works to it, they're just telling us what is biblical salvation. Biblical, biblical regeneration. They're talking about the law work. They're talking about Legal repentance and evangelical repentance. You see, uh, the modern uh, preacher would say repentance is just a change of mind. You see, I never believed that Jesus was God. Now I believe he was God. Now he's God. So I'm, I, I've repented. Never changes my life. Never, never breaks off. Uh, I never break off my life uh, sins. I never turned. No godly sorrow, no repentance, no, no reformation, that's not required. 
You've made a decision. You're ones. That's what, this is 99%, 95, I'll give you some. 99, 95% of the, of the gospel today. The sinner can do something. God, Holy Spirit is killing the sinner, wants to kill the sinner. And, and, and evangelical repentance is necessary. And so Burkhoff says this, we distinguish three elements in repentance. There is an intellectual element. There is a change of view, a recognition of sin as involving personal guilt, defilement, helplessness. It is designated in scripture as uh, the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. Romans 1.32 If this is not accomplished by the following elements, it may manifest itself as fear of punishment, while there is yet no hatred of sin. You see, you know, when there's hatred of sin, you see, it's not just I want a ticket to heaven. You see, when I hate sin, then I begin to love the life of Christ. I want to be like Christ. Isn't that really, you know, when you saw, when the Lord, Lord opened your eyes, you said, I want to be like Christ. I want, to, I want to be like Him. I want to imitate Him. I want to follow Him. You see, that's saying you hate sin. Hate unrighteousness. Second element, he says, emotional element. There, there's a change of feeling. Manifest itself in sorrow for sin, committed against a holy and just God. Psalm 51, 2, 10 and 14. This element of repentance is indicated by the word uh, repentance, but it, it, has, it, is, it is accomplished by the following elements. It speaks of godly sorrow. But it is not so accomplished. It is not accomplished by the sorrow of the world. Manifested itself in remorse and despair. You see, uh, uh, Judas had despair. He had despair of the world. That's why he went out and hung himself. And so there's going to be an emotion, uh, an, an intellectual element, a knowledge of sin, guilt, defilement, helplessness. Um, it's not just a fear. That's why Paul says uh, in Romans 8, it's not, it wasn't a fear of bondage again, but now we have a new spirit. It's called the spirit of adoption. That's regeneration. The work of the law brings us under fear of judgment, but then there, there's that transition from legal to evangelical, from, uh, in a sense, from darkness to light. Uh, it, the element is, is, in a sense, of what we call philao. We, 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 you know, it's against my father, like the prodigal. It's a, a family word. It's not a, just like I, I committed sin against the judge. And then finally, volitional. So there's intellectual element, there's an emotional element, and then there's a volitional element, meaning the will. I like, how, I, I like what Dr. Seuss says. He says, it's the whole man receiving the whole Christ. What does that mean? Well, you receive Christ in your head. You know, that's the old Puritan. So, prophet, king, and priest. I like potentate. Well, see, the Lord Jesus is the prophet. Well, he, he is the Lord of your mind. He's, he's the one who speaks to him. He's the light of the world. Has the priest. What is he? Well, you see, he, he, inter, he, he guards the inner chamber of your heart. That's where the blood is applied. You see, the law can't go back there once you're saved. It, see, it's because the blood has been applied to the door, door post of the heart. There's peace. See, the blood of Christ speaks peace. And, and the Lord Jesus is right there. And you see, you realize that I'm accepted in the beloved. And then there's prophet, priest, and king, right? Is Jesus Lord? Is Jesus Lord? That's volitional. You see, I like, I like, you see, go back for a moment. Think of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. What's the two things he said? Who art thou, Lord? I'm the prophet. I'm the light of the world. That's why there was a bright light around him. The manifestation of the glory of God. Jesus Christ. And, the, and, and so Paul says, Saul says, Who art thou, Lord? It says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard to kick against the pricks. He was under conviction. And what was the other thing he said? Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? So the volitional element 
there is also a volitional element consisting in a change of purpose, an inward turning from sin, and a dispositions to seek pardon and cleansing. Psalm 51, 5, 7, and 10. Jeremiah 25, 5. This includes the two other elements, meaning the intellectual element and the emotional element, and is therefore the most important aspect of repentance. Is it, it is indicated in Scripture by the word, <coughs> let's see what it says, Acts 2.38. What does Acts 2.38 the same. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. 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 See, conviction by conviction of sin by the law, with the regenerating uh, working of the Holy Spirit, brings faith, repentance. It becomes efficacious. Efficacious grace. I think I'll stop here. Because not only we see the work of the Holy Spirit and uh, signs of, you know, where conviction of sin, you know, uh, just because, like, like many, many say, in the Bible, I believe conviction of sin doesn't save you. Getting to Christ does. <coughs> Getting to Christ. And I want to next time look at conviction of sin and the Word of God. Okay? The Word of God. Let me read one verse, two verses from Hebrews 4, and then we'll close. Hebrews 4. Look at 12 and 13. Familiar verses. You've probably read these verses. You've probably memorized these verses. They're good verses for sure. Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him that whom we have to do. See, God, Holy Spirit, pulls out of the... Uh, out of, out of the war chest, the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. I believe they work together, okay, in this matter of conviction of sin. But the whole idea, again, is, is that as we realize that the sinner is fortified, this uh, peace of the world, and, uh, you know, they're unconcerned, they're unaware, and, and they're, they're, they're on their merry way. Living a dream, a delusion. And dear ones, we have to be very skillful in God's grace and mercy uh, as the Holy Spirit would lead us uh, to understand what true repentance is. What are the uh, true marks of saving faith? Yeah, are there? What, what should we expect when, when someone says, I'm a Christian, I've repented, and, and, and I've trusted Christ? Uh, should we expect newness of life? An intellectual, an emotional, a volitional change in one's life? Well, see, we're not, we're not saying, well, this is my standard. We're saying this is a biblical standard. You see, what has happened today is we have lowered the standard so much, so much, the church is filled with unregenerate, lost men and women, boys and girls. They've made a decision. They've done everything what the preacher said to do. But they're still living in that, now it's in a sense a religious. Remember I said? They're awakened for a moment. They confess their sins. Maybe they weep a little bit. And then they go back to sleep on their religious profession. And then overall, in examination, well, that's so uncharitable that you're going to examine, you're going to judge them? Well, what would you do to a friend who you love? Would you just allow them to sleep when the house is on fire? They made a profession, they've been duped by the devil, they show no marks of salvation, no, no genuine repentance, no saving faith, no obedience, no lordship, 
Nothing. And they believe they're in. That's the most unloving thing to do. Is to allow your loved ones, your friends, your, your neighbors, and fellow Christians, quote unquote, that show no marks of regeneration, to live in, in a lie. And wake up in hell. This is their business. But though thanks be unto God, like Spurgeon, he says, I don't want people to live, I want them to die first. And God, Holy Spirit, is able to make, kill them, and he's able to make them alive, and then, you know, God's elect will come. God's elect will come. Take a moment to uh, examine your, your methods, your evangelism, your message. You know, there's nothing wrong with the Romans Road. But if you only get a decision, and not a changed life, You've missed it. you missed it. And you, you, you're actually a false prophet, don't you think? Maybe? Deceived? Very serious business. Because it's a soul, an internal soul. But most of all, it's God's glory and honor and the praise of the Lord Jesus. What a commission. What a trust. What a stewardship. Boy, that's what Paul says. I, I, I fear, I tremble that I have to present the gospel to a sinner. And you say, I have to get all these things right? Well, you better work on it. God will help you. Won't he? God will give you grace to understand all these things. But also to apply the gospel and be a faithful witness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we, we look at these examples of uh, those who were convicted but walked away from the Lord Jesus. And uh, Lord, we see that... Uh, Unless you shatter the peace of the sinner, this worldly peace, unless you bring conviction of sin, unless you bring them to a place of dying, death to self, on the cross, like Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. He said, I am dead to the law. Why? Because he was dead. He was married to another. And every one of us. That's the truth of the Word of God, as the Holy Spirit kills us by the Word of God and then brings newness of life. Father, we pray that we would examine our gospel. We would examine our methods. And we do believe tonight that salvation is of the Lord. And there's no sinner, uh, even tonight, in, in our hearing. There's no sinner beyond the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word of God, and in the intercession of Christ. If Christ died for them, they shall be brought. All that the Father given to me shall come to me. And him that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Oh Lord, make it good, I pray. And bless thy word. Oh Lord, remember the word that was preached there on the streets of Ottawa. Yesterday in, in Cornwall and many places where the word of God goes. We, we're trusting you to bless the Lord. Some plant, some water. But God, Holy Father, you have to give the increase. And may you give the increase for the encouragement and blessing of thy church. To see souls saved. But most of all, that the Lord Jesus would be exalted and praised and magnified. That's our heart tonight, Lord. We want you to be magnified. We want you to have all the credit. We want a glory in Christ. Because he's worthy. Thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' precious name.